Chapter 8 The Mastery of Procrastination The Seventh Step Toward Riches Accurate analysis of over 25,000 men and women who had experienced failure disclosed the fact that lack of decision was near the head of the list of the 30 major causes of failure. This is no mere statement of a theory. It is a fact. Procrastination, the opposite of decision, is a common enemy which practically every man must conquer. You will have an opportunity to test your capacity to reach quick and definite decisions when you finish reading this book and are ready to begin putting into action the principles which it describes. Analysis of several hundred people who had accumulated fortunes well beyond the million dollar mark disclosed the fact that every one of them had the habit of reaching decisions promptly and of changing these decisions slowly if and when they were changed. People who fail to accumulate money without exception have the habit of reaching decisions, if at all, very slowly and of changing these decisions quickly and often. One of Henry Ford's most outstanding qualities is his habit of reaching decisions quickly and definitely and changing them slowly. This quality is so pronounced in Mr. Ford that it has given him the reputation of being obstinate. It was this quality which prompted Mr. Ford to continue to manufacture his famous Model T, the world's ugliest car, when all of his advisors and many of the purchasers of the car were urging him to change it. Perhaps Mr. Ford delayed too long in making the change, but the other side of the story is that Mr. Ford's firmness of decision yielded a huge fortune before the change in model became necessary. There is but little doubt that Mr. Ford's habit of definiteness of decision assumes the proportion of obstinacy, but this quality is preferable to slowness in reaching decisions and quickness in changing them. The majority of people who fail to accumulate money sufficient for their needs are generally easily influenced by the opinions of others. They permit the newspapers and the gossiping neighbors to do their thinking for them. Opinions are the cheapest commodities on earth. Everyone has a flock of opinions ready to be wished upon anyone who will accept them. If you are influenced by opinions when you reach decisions, you will not succeed in any undertaking, much less in that of transmuting your own desire into money. If you are influenced by the opinions of others, you will have no desire of your own. Keep your counsel when you begin to put into practice the principles described here by reaching your own decisions and following them. Take no one into your confidence except the members of your mastermind group and be very sure in your selection of this group that you choose only those who will be in complete sympathy and harmony with your purpose. Close friends and relatives, while not meaning to do so, often handicap one through opinions and sometimes through ridicule, which is meant to be humorous. Thousands of men and women carry inferiority complexes with them all through life because some well-meaning but ignorant person destroyed their confidence through opinions or ridicule. You have a brain and mind of your own. Use it and reach your own decisions. If you need facts or information from other people to enable you to reach decisions, as you probably will in many instances, acquire these facts or secure the information you need quietly without disclosing your purpose. It is characteristic of people who have but a smattering or veneer of knowledge to try to give the impression that they have much knowledge. Such people generally do too much talking and too little listening. Keep your eyes and ears wide open and your mouth closed if you wish to acquire the habit of prompt decision. Those who talk too much do little else. If you talk more than you listen, you not only deprive yourself of many opportunities to accumulate useful knowledge, but you also disclose your plans and purposes to people who will take great delight in defeating you because they envy you. Remember also that every time you open your mouth in the presence of a person who has an abundance of knowledge, you display to that person your exact stock of knowledge or your lack of it. Genuine wisdom is usually conspicuous through modesty and silence. Keep in mind the fact that every person with whom you associate is, like yourself, seeking the opportunity to accumulate money. If you talk about your plans too freely, 
You may be surprised when you learn that some other person has beaten you to your goal by putting into action ahead of you the plans of which you talked unwisely. Let one of your first decisions be to keep a closed mouth and open ears and eyes. As a reminder to yourself to follow this advice, it will be helpful if you copy the following epigram in large letters and place it where you will see it daily. Tell the world what you intend to do, but first show it. This is the equivalent of saying that deeds and not words are what count most. Freedom or death on a decision. The value of decisions depends upon the courage required to render them. The great decisions, which served as the foundation of civilization, were reached by assuming great risks, which often meant the possibility of death. Lincoln's decision to issue his famous Proclamation of Emancipation, which gave freedom to the colored people of America, was rendered with full understanding that his act would turn thousands of friends and political supporters against him. He knew, too, that carrying out that proclamation would mean death to thousands of men on the battlefield. In the end, it cost Lincoln his life. That required courage. Socrates' decision to drink the cup of poison, rather than compromise in his personal belief, was a decision of courage. It turned time ahead a thousand years and gave to people then unborn the right to freedom of thought and speech. The decision of Robert E. Lee when he came to the parting of the way with the Union and took up the cause of the South was a decision of courage, for he well knew that it might cost him his own life, that it would surely cost the lives of others. But the greatest decision of all time, as far as any American citizen is concerned, was reached in Philadelphia July 4, 1776, when 56 men signed their names to a document which they well knew would bring freedom to all Americans or leave every one of the 56 hanging from a gallows. You have heard of this famous document, but you may not have drawn from it the great lesson in personal achievement it so plainly taught. We all remember the date of this monumentous decision, but few of us realize what courage that decision required. We remember our history as it was taught, we remember dates and the names of the men who fought. We remember Valley Forge and Yorktown. We remember George Washington and Lord Cornwallis. But we know little of the real forces back of these names, dates, and places. We know still less of that intangible power which ensured us freedom long before Washington's armies reached Yorktown. We read the history of the Revolution and falsely imagine that George Washington was the father of our country that it was he who won our freedom, while the truth is, Washington was only an accessory after the fact because victory for his armies had been ensured long before Lord Cornwallis surrendered. This is not intended to rob Washington of any of the glory he so richly merited. Its purpose, rather, is to give greater attention to the astounding power that was the real cause of his victory. It is nothing short of tragedy that the writers of history have missed entirely even the slightest reference to the irresistible power which gave birth and freedom to the nation destined to set up new standards of independence for all the peoples of the earth. I say it is a tragedy because it is the self-same power which must be used by every individual who surmounts the difficulties of life and forces life to pay the price asked. Let us briefly review the events which gave birth to this power. The story begins with an incident in Boston, March 5, 1770. British soldiers were patrolling the streets and by their presence openly threatening the citizens. The colonists resented armed men marching in their midst. They began to express their resentment openly, hurling stones as well as epithets at the marching soldiers until the commanding officer gave orders, Fix bayonets! charge. The battle was on. It resulted in the death and injury of many. The incident aroused such resentment that the provincial assembly made up of prominent colonists called a meeting for the purpose of taking definite action. Two of the members of that assembly were John Hancock and Samuel Adams. Long live their names. They spoke up courageously and declared that a move must be made to eject all British soldiers from Boston. Remember this, 
a decision in the minds of two men might properly be called the beginning of the freedom which we of the United States now enjoy. Remember, too, that the decision of these two men called for faith and courage because it was dangerous. Before the assembly adjourned, Samuel Adams was appointed to call on the governor of the province, Hutchinson, and demand the withdrawal of British troops. The request was granted. The troops were removed from Boston, but the incident was not closed. It had caused a situation destined to change the entire trend of civilization. Strange, is it not, how the great changes such as the American Revolution and the World War often have their beginnings in circumstances which seem unimportant? It is interesting also to observe that these important changes usually begin in the form of a definite decision in the minds of a relatively small number of people. Few of us know the history of our country well enough to realize that John Hancock, Samuel Adams, and Richard Henry Lee of the province of Virginia were the real fathers of our country. Richard Henry Lee became an important factor in this story by reason of the fact that he and Samuel Adams communicated frequently by correspondence, sharing freely their fears and their hopes concerning the welfare of the people of their provinces. From this practice, Adams conceived the idea that a mutual exchange of letters between the thirteen colonies might help to bring about the coordination of efforts so badly needed in connection with the solution of their problems. Two years after the clash with the soldiers in Boston, March 72, Adams presented this idea to the assembly in the form of a motion that a correspondence committee be established among the colonies with definitely appointed correspondence in each colony for the purpose of friendly cooperation for the betterment of the colonies of British America. Mark well this incident. It was the beginning of the organization of the far-flung power destined to give freedom to you and to me. The mastermind had already been organized. It consisted of Adams, Lee, and Hancock. I tell you further that if two of you agree upon the earth concerning anything for which you ask, it will come to you from my Father who is in heaven. The Committee of Correspondence was organized. Observe that this move provided the way for increasing the power of the mastermind by adding to it men from all the colonies. Take notice that this procedure constituted the first organized planning of the disgruntled colonists. In union there is strength. The citizens of the colonies had been waging disorganized warfare against the British soldiers through incidents similar to the Boston riot, but nothing of benefit had been accomplished. Their individual grievances had not been consolidated under one mastermind. No group of individuals had put their hearts, minds, souls, and bodies together in one definite decision to settle their difficulty with the British once and for all, until Adams, Hancock, and Lee got together. Meanwhile, the British were not idle. They, too, were doing some planning and masterminding on their own account, with the advantage of having back of them money and organized soldiery. The Crown appointed Gage to supplant Hutchinson as the governor of Massachusetts. One of the new governor's first acts was to send a messenger to call on Samuel Adams for the purpose of endeavoring to stop his opposition. By fear. We can best understand the spirit of what happened by quoting the conversation between Colonel Fenton, the messenger sent by Gage, and Adams. Colonel Fenton, I have been authorized by Governor Gage to assure you, Mr. Adams, that the governor has been empowered to confer upon you such benefits as would be satisfactory. Endeavor to win Adams by promise of bribes. Upon the condition that you engage to cease in your opposition to the measures of the government. It is the government's advice to you, sir, not to incur the further displeasure of His Majesty. Your conduct has been such as makes you liable to penalties of an order of Henry VIII, by which persons can be sent to England for trial for treason or misprision of treason at the discretion of a governor of a province. But, by changing your political course, you will not only receive great personal advantages, but you will make your peace with the king. Samuel Adams had the choice of two decisions. He could cease his opposition and receive personal bribes, or he could continue and run the risk of being hanged. Clearly the time had come when Adams was forced to reach instantly 
a decision which could have cost his life. The majority of men would have found it difficult to reach such a decision. The majority would have sent back an evasive reply, but not Adams. He insisted upon Colonel Fenton's word of honor that the Colonel would deliver to the Governor the answer exactly as Adams would give it to him. Adams answer, Then you may tell Governor Gage that I trust I have long since made my peace with the King of Kings. No personal consideration shall induce me to abandon the righteous cause of my country. And tell Governor Gage it is the advice of Samuel Adams to him no longer to insult the feelings of an exasperated people. Comment as to the character of this man seems unnecessary. It must be obvious to all who read this astounding message that its sender possessed loyalty of the highest order. This is important. Racketeers and dishonest politicians have prostituted the honor for which such men as Adams died. When Governor Gage received Adams' caustic reply, he flew into a rage and issued a proclamation which read, I do hereby, in His Majesty's name, offer and promise His Most Gracious Pardon to all persons who shall forthwith lay down their arms and return to the duties of peaceable subjects, accepting only from the benefit of such pardon Samuel Adams and John Hancock, whose offenses are too flagitious a nature to admit to any other consideration but that of condign punishment. As one might say in modern slang, Adams and Hancock were on the spot. The threat of the irate governor forced the two men to reach another decision, equally as dangerous. They hurriedly called a secret meeting of their staunchest followers. Here the mastermind began to take on momentum. After the meeting had been called to order, Adams locked the door, placed the key in his pocket, and informed all present that it was imperative that a Congress of the colonists be organized and that no man should leave the room until the decision for such a Congress had been reached. Great excitement followed. Some weighed the possible consequences of such radicalism, old man fear. Some expressed grave doubt as to the wisdom of so definite a decision in defiance of the crown. Locked in that room were two men immune to fear, blind to the possibility of failure, Hancock and Adams. Through the influence of their minds, the others were induced to agree that, through the correspondence committee, arrangements should be made for a meeting of the First Continental Congress to be held in Philadelphia, September 5, 1774. Remember this date. It is more important than July 4, 1776. If there had been no decision to hold a Continental Congress, there could have been no signing of the Declaration of Independence. Before the first meeting of the new Congress, another leader in a different section of the country was deep in the throes of publishing a summary view of the rights of British America. He was Thomas Jefferson of the province of Virginia, whose relationship to Lord Dunmore, representative of the Crown in Virginia, was as strained as that of Hancock and Adams with their governor. Shortly after his famous summary of rights was published, Jefferson was informed that he was subject to prosecution for high treason against His Majesty's government. Inspired by the threat, one of Jefferson's colleagues, Patrick Henry, boldly spoke his mind, concluding his remarks with a sentence which shall remain forever a classic. If this be treason, then make the most of it. It was such men as these who, without power, without authority, without military strength, without money, sat in solemn consideration of the destiny of the colonies, beginning at the opening of the First Continental Congress and continuing at intervals for two years until on June 7, 1776, Richard Henry Lee arose, addressed the chair, and to the startled assembly made this motion. Gentlemen, I make the motion that these united colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states, that they be absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is, and ought to be, totally dissolved. Lee's astounding motion was discussed fervently, and at such length that he began to lose patience. Finally, after days of argument, he again took the floor and declared in a clear, firm voice, Mr. President, we have discussed this issue for days. It is the only course for us to follow. Why then, sir, do we longer delay? 
Why still deliberate? Let this happy day give birth to an American republic. Let her arise not to devastate and to conquer, but to reestablish the reign of peace and of law. The eyes of Europe are fixed upon us. She demands of us a living example of freedom that may exhibit a contrast in the felicity of the citizen to the ever-increasing tyranny. Before this motion was finally voted upon, Lee was called back to Virginia because of serious family illness, but before leaving he placed his cause in the hands of his friend, Thomas Jefferson, who promised to fight until favorable action was taken. Shortly thereafter, the President of the Congress, Hancock, appointed Jefferson as chairman of a committee to draw up a Declaration of Independence. Long and hard the committee labored on a document which would mean, when accepted by the Congress, that every man who signed it would be signing his own death warrant should the colonies lose in the fight with Great Britain, which was sure to follow. The document was drawn, and on June 28, the original draft was read before the Congress. For several days it was discussed, altered, and made ready. On July 4, 1776, Thomas Jefferson stood before the assembly and fearlessly read the most momentous decision ever placed upon paper. When... In the course of human events, it is necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. When Jefferson finished, the document was voted upon, accepted, and signed by the fifty-six men every one staking his own life upon his decision to write his name. By that decision came into existence a nation destined to bring to mankind forever the privilege of making decisions. By decisions made in a similar spirit of faith, and only by such decisions can men solve their personal problems and win for themselves high estates of material and spiritual wealth. Let us not forget this analyze the events which led to the Declaration of Independence and be convinced that this nation, which now holds a position of commanding respect and power among all nations of the world, was born of a decision created by a mastermind consisting of 56 men. Note well the fact that it was their decision which ensured the success of Washington's armies because the spirit of that decision was in the heart of every soldier who fought with him and served as a spiritual power which recognizes no such thing as failure. Note also, with great personal benefit, that the power which gave this nation its freedom is the self-same power that must be used by every individual who becomes self-determining. This power is made up of the principles described in this book. It will not be difficult to detect in the story of the Declaration of Independence at least six of these principles, Desire, decision, faith, persistence, the mastermind, and organized planning. Throughout this philosophy will be found the suggestion that thought, backed by strong desire, has a tendency to transmute itself into its physical equivalent. Before passing on, I wish to leave with you the suggestion that one may find in this story, and in the story of the organization of the United States Steel Corporation, a perfect description of the method by which thought makes this astounding transformation. In your search for the secret of the method, do not look for a miracle because you will not find it. You will find only the eternal laws of nature. These laws are available to every person who has the faith and the courage to use them. They may be used to bring freedom to a nation or to accumulate riches. There is no charge save the time necessary to understand and appropriate them. Those who reach decisions promptly and definitely know what they want and generally get it. The leaders in every walk of life decide quickly and firmly. That is the major reason why they are leaders. The world has the habit of making room for the man whose words and actions show that he knows where he is going. Indecision is a habit which usually begins in youth. The habit takes on a permanency as the youth goes through graded school, high school, and even through college without definiteness of purpose. The major weakness of all educational systems is that they neither teach nor encourage the habit of definite decision. 
It would be beneficial if no college would permit the enrollment of any student unless and until the student declared his major purpose in matriculating. It would be of still greater benefit if every student who enters the graded schools were compelled to accept training in the habit of decision and forced to pass a satisfactory examination on this subject before being permitted to advance in the grade. The habit of indecision, acquired because of the deficiencies of our school system, goes with the student into the occupation he chooses if, in fact, he chooses his occupation. Generally, the youth just out of school seeks any job that can be found. He takes the first place he finds because he has fallen into the habit of indecision. Ninety-eight out of every hundred people working for wages today are in the positions they hold because they lack the definiteness of decision to plan a definite position and the knowledge of how to choose an employer. Definiteness of decision always requires courage, sometimes very great courage. The 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence stake their lives on the decision to affix their signatures to that document. The person who reaches a definite decision to procure the particular job and make life pay the price he asks does not stake his life on that decision. He stakes his economic freedom. Financial independence, riches, desirable business, and professional positions are not within reach of the person who neglects or refuses to expect, plan, and demand these things. The person who desires riches in the same spirit that Samuel Adams desired freedom for the colonies is sure to accumulate wealth. In the chapter on organized planning, you will find complete instructions for marketing every type of personal services. You will find also detailed information on how to choose the employer you prefer and the particular job you desire. These instructions will be of no value to you unless you definitely decide to organize them into a plan of action.